Rabbit Rabbit or Happy July 1st, everyone. I'm so excited about today's program. It is our 12th or my 12th episode, which means a year anniversary of doing this. And it's been a really fun thing for me to bring to you every month, even on months that I'm stressed and don't really have a lot of time to put into it. Um, but I'm just so happy you're here. If you're new to this program and to my channel, thank you for tuning in and I hope you'll subscribe. Um, my goal is to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of the summer. Um, so I'll hope, I hope you help me with that. And if you're, um, already a subscriber, thank you for coming back and supporting me. I appreciate it more than you will ever know. It is a um, interesting and fabulous community that we're a part of, and I have made so many friends and learned so much about people around the world, and your support means so much to me. So if you're new to the program, Tea With Me is basically this. It's a video chat about all things paper-related, like in the junk journal, mixed media world, and it's also an opportunity to um, tell you the things I'm working on, show you some products and books I can recommend, and um, maybe even do a little quick little lesson or craft with you every month. So I try to make sure that this is um, a fun chat, like you've come to my studio to sit and have a cup of tea with me. But I also want it to be filled with content that's useful to you, maybe inspirational to you. And um, I, try, I, I work hard to try to bring some interesting things to you. And I'm really excited about today's show. So before I start, let me say that um, from this point on, I, I tried to do this in one last video. I'm going to start time stamping in the box below so that if there's a specific thing I'm going over today, then you can just fast forward to those pieces and tune into the things that interest you. I hope everybody stays to the end and sits with me like it's a visit, but I understand how how your time is and I'm happy if there's even just one bit of information I'm bringing you that's that you enjoy. So let me tell you about what's on tap for today. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a couple little things going on in my life and my creative world. I'm going to be going over one of my absolute favorite artists and bookmakers. I'm going to be giving you a little background on her and giving you a book recommendation on some things relating to her. Her name is Gwen Frostick. Um, I'm going to be showing you an int or introducing you to um, a friend of mine who's a stationary artist and she has a free download right now. So if you tune in, you'll be able to get her free download. And then we're going to do a little primer, um, a primer on photography uh, in regards to using it as a as a supply in your junk journal and mixed media work and being able to determine how old the photo is and what type of photo to use to feature in your journals and in your artwork. I've, I've found it to be a very fascinating and enjoyable part of junk journaling and I want to share that information with you and hope that it'll give you a little history lesson on when you see old photographs what to look for when you're looking for something for your work. So let's get started first with I always share the tea I'm drinking and I'm still working on my special teas that um, Liz Van Wessem sent me last year and I still love getting uh, using them every month um, Liz and this month is a Pickwick Minty Morocco so very excited to try this tea I'm not putting any milk or sweetener in it this time I don't generally do it, but I do find that milk is kind of enjoyable in it. I never started until I went to London, but, you know, I do enjoy it. So cheers. Hmm. Oh, that's nice. I really like that one. Okay, I'm going to start first by going back one video to my studio tour last month um, on, on, I believe it's May's Tea With Me. And I introduced you to this girl. 
and she sits on my desk and she's just one of those little artist models that you make sketches from but she tends to get all my little um, fibers that I'm when I'm working on fiber kits and things she gets them <laughs> so she sits here on my desk and in that episode I asked you guys if you had any suggestions for her name so I just wanted to show you that I got five suggestions that I think are all great and I can't decide between them Gladys Prudence Frida Faye and Ethel now I think she reminds me of many of these names for different reasons, and I'm having a hard time picking. So I bring this up because if you head over to my Instagram page, I will have a giveaway for a contest to name her, and then I'm going to give something away. I haven't decided what I'm giving away yet, um, but... I thought it would be fun if we all name her together and then she'll even have more meaning for me when she's sitting on the table. And I thank the people who gave me suggestions. I really appreciate it. Um, I love when you guys interact with me on my videos and getting these names was was really cool. So let's go over to Instagram and do that at some point. But I wanted to bring that up. The second thing I wanted to bring up before I start any of my book recommendations is a video recommendation. So I don't know about you guys, but right now there's just so much going on in the world that's negative and sad and weighs on my heart that when I tune into YouTube to look at junk journals or tutorials, I just want to cut out the noise. I don't want to talk about those things. I want to escape from those things for a little bit. And I know it's a privilege that I even get to escape from those things. Um, but it's really important to my mental health just to quiet my brain a little bit. And I find that lately my go-to to quiet my brain and I am probably going to destroy the pronunciation of her name, and I, I apologize for that. But Fraukia, or Fruukia, you tell me which one. She, she, her Instagram and YouTube channel is called The Quiet Rebel, and it just, I just love it. I love it because when I tune into YouTube, a lot of times I do want specific projects and specific junk journal type of things but I also really enjoy a channel that has a variety of creative and inspirational and vintage um, content and Frokia really does it she has such a great sense of style she has decorating videos she has um, journaling videos she has nature videos she has a travel she has a little of everything she has haul videos but first of all she's the most calm person ever to listen to. Her editing and the way that she films is so creative and sweet. I can so appreciate the time and the effort she puts into her videos. And she keeps them very short and sweet, which I really appreciate. And I'm going to kind of give a little, um, I don't know, this might sound weird, but I usually fall asleep to them, not because they're boring or anything, but because they're so relaxing. I put them on in bed and, uh, Frokia, I don't know how you feel about that, but it's really a compliment that really I look forward to tuning into you. It's like visiting with a friend, and I wish that we lived closer. So everybody, go to her YouTube or her Instagram. You will not be sorry. Okay, so now I'm going to do my book recommendation for the month. Okay, so when I make a book recommendation, one of the things that's key to me is making sure that it's something that's affordable for everybody to get and something that you can get internationally either through, you know, A books, thrift books, Amazon, something like that. And I don't like I don't like to recommend books that are not um financially accessible to everybody. So these books here I stumbled across at a library book sale uh, probably I don't know, five to eight years ago. And I had never heard of Gwen Frostick before, and I simply fell in love with her. She, before I was even a junk journaler, I think what appealed to me in these books is that she was already putting together interesting papers and doing very artistic books that she self-published in her studio, and 
they she wrote her own poetry she did all the illustrations i mean everything she does in these books these books are all made by her which is really amazing she was born in 1906 and and um died uh, on her like the day before her 95th birthday in 2001 so these books which were you know um published you know between 1957 and 1999 the earlier ones she actually worked on. And that is so cool. Like she had the printing presses in her studio and did them herself. So when you're like touching one of her books and her papers to know that she did that to me just blows me away. So a little bit about Gwen before I start. She um, was she an artist and a poet and one of the first female entrepreneurs um, who... Basically, when on a, the time when peop, women were not starting their own small businesses, took her art after art school and made a studio and sold papers and books and metal craft and all these things that she did out of her her studio. And she ended up buying a 40 acre piece of property in Michigan where she always lived. And um, she had like 12 printing presses and she would do linotype artwork and then put them in these these books and she made stationery and other things too so let me just jump right in and say two of these books have really pretty um you know engravings to from from the giver to the receiver of longtime friends which i thought made these books even sweeter so this one's called these things are ours and uh, typical gwen frostick books always have a certain look there's no dust jacket to them um, they're hard covered chipboard and they're usually the standard size of six by nine um, they're they're thin books they, they their spine ranges this one obviously is a little bit thicker but you can get them each volume for somewhere between five and ten dollars and when you look inside you'll see why this is worth it so these are all like hand um, letter pressed on and what's neat about her books is she uses very beautiful, thick, handmade, and well, not all handmade paper, I don't think, but um, a lot of it is handmade. It's deckled, and a lot of the imprintings, the engravings, you can actually even feel. And they're done from a, um, like I said, she would do a lino, a lino, you know, a, an engraving. And then after she did the engraving, she would then take that um, engraving and put it on a Heidelberg press, a letter, pr a letter press, and she would then press every page, you know, through the, the letter presses. It's, it's really amazing that these are all lino cuts. So, and I think I might have said linotype, but I meant lino cuts. So like you can see that she uses different papers in her books, but I just, I'm going to show you a few special pages, which, so that we don't, if we'd be here all day if I showed you every page. So this is a lino cut, and if you can see, she's actually used different colors of ink that she's had to put on the plates before she prints them, which is amazing. And all the poetry um, she writes herself she's a naturalist and and everything is about nature her this particular page I loved because of all the different colors she used but the texture on it is phenomenal and it's so pretty can you see how pretty that is another typical thing that she does let me just fast oh look at this page here I love the colors that she uses on that page and the deckled edges do you see the deckled edges find another page okay so always in her books she puts some handmade paper that's translucent and always has very interesting textures and colors in them in this particular book she used this paper which is lovely um, but she also embeds things in her papers and they're just beautiful now I would never suggest cutting up a book this beautiful, but at that price point, or if you found one damaged, just imagine how beautiful some of these pages would be 
in in your work i mean they're just they're just phenomenal so this one is these things are ours this one's called a walk with me it's a little bit thicker i'm not going to go through a lot of this book but i just wanted to show you um a hand picked out one page oh i didn't pick out that one but look how beautiful it is one of the things I really liked is every now and then she'll just have blank pages with really simple engravings on them. And I thought, wow, that's really beautiful for, for use in junk journals and artwork. And if we can cut up an Edith Holden, um, I can't personally cut up these, but if I had like, if I came across some really cheap or damaged ones um, in a book sale, I would love to use her work in my, in my junk journals. And the last example I'm going to show you of her, hers is something that's very classic of hers, where she takes handmade paper and she embeds pieces of nature in them. This one happens to be a fern. Isn't that gorgeous? And then most people will, if they're Gwen, Gwen followers, love her butterfly pages, where she actually embeds a butterfly in, it, in her work. Isn't that lovely? And I mean, think about that. Think about how old this book is and just how beautifully it's maintained and that, you know, you have this for decades. I mean, I don't know the publishing date on this one. This is 1965, 1965. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about over 50 years old. So just just to give you a little more appreciation of her work, she was got very ill when she was young, and she ended up getting symptoms of cerebral palsy after. She had very weak hands and wrists, and she still was able to do this. I mean, it's really amazing. So if you're, if you're looking for some really beautiful books for your collection, or you just want some really beautiful materials, um, check out Gwen Frostick. She has a, a business called Press Craft Papers that still exists and is run by her nephew. She never married or had kids. Her nephew and some family friends own the business. She's from Michigan. There's a museum to her in Michigan. The um, University of Michigan uh, named their art school after her. It's called the Gwen Frostick School of Art. She, t she published 23 books. She has note cards. You name it. This woman is amazing. And these books are amazing. So my recommendation this month is check out Gwen Frostick. Okay. Okay, I'm back with a different background. Um, I felt like the flowers were a little bit too busy for the next part of the video and I didn't want to make anybody a little seasick. So I'm going to start with a little recommendation here. Um, my friend Kimberly Dodge, she's a stationary artist. She runs a website called Dodges and Daisies and you can find it down here and I'll put the link below. She is a stationary artist, which means she designs things for stationery and stickers, printables, things like that. And she has more of sort of a, a modern edge to it than a vintage edge, but she combines them seamlessly in her collages and her layouts. And they're perfect for journaling and for decorating happy mail. And, and I'm not even going to show you an example because... I want you to go to her website and her Instagram and look because she does it better than anyone. So I'd like you to see how she uses things. Her postcards, she sends out dozens of postcards a week and they are just gorgeous. You got to check out her feed. But anyway, she has a new free printable, which I thought was so clever. It's called Mask Girls. And this is only printed out at 50%. It's not really the size that they are. They're usually this size. And they're I, my printer right now, it's really not doing a great job, so please know that the printable is a much better quality than my, my, printer, my printer prints off. But she has made these beautiful ladies all wearing masks, which is so typical of what's going on in the world today. And this particular download is free. And I've downloaded it on a few different sizes. And basically, once you print it out, you can just fussy cut 
And I don't know about you, but this is such a interesting, crazy, weird time that my journals a lot have been about the subjects of what it's like living right now in a 2020 pandemic world. And I make these collage spreads where I'm journaling in it and just think how interesting it would be to use, you know, some of these images because they're so appropriate to the time we're living in. They're also so sweet and they look like the vibe of who we are. Um, the, I just think they're a great tool to have on your desk in your tray of little go-to images that you can use in your artwork. And the nice thing that she does is this printable is free, but she has a a companion printable of all these ladies without their masks, which I think is even cooler because then you could have a spread that has, let's say, this girl on it with and without her mask. Oops. And I'm hoping the masks are only a temporary part of our life. And that one day when we look back on our journals and we see th images like this, we'll reflect on what it was like to live now. And hopefully we're so far past that. But I, I just wanted to share this with you and share her work with you. Um, you can find so much inspiration on her Instagram feed and on her website. She does have an Etsy shop too. She's also a talented um, photographer. And she has two of the cutest fur babies around. So check out Dodges and Daisies. Okay, so I think we've kind of gone over a lot of the little parts of our of our tea with me. Um, we've done some recommendations and got caught up on a couple of things. And now I kind of want to move on to the little photography primer. Okay, so if you don't have a cup yet, this is a perfect time to go get a cup and relax and just look at some gorgeous images and learn a little bit about history. First saying, I am not an antique collector. I don't buy things to collect things. Um, sometimes I buy things so that I have the ability to scan or use it for my work and then I will resell it or let it go. But I'm not personally looking for the best quality or a collectible piece. So I may not have an example of every single thing I talk about today. But what if I don't have an example of it, it's probably not something you're going to come across easily or be able to afford either. I tend to find buy things that I can afford for my as materials for my mixed media and my paper craft. Um, I'm not looking to buy a $50 image that I'm going to hold onto or resell. So you're probably not either unless you're a collector. And if you're a collector, you're probably not watching this video anyway because you already know all of this. So I'm talking more to for the basic um, scrapbooker, junk journaler, or mixed media person who goes to flea markets, estate sales, um, may even have some of this stuff in your own attic or from your own relatives and aren't really sure what you have or how to use it. So I'm going to start back in the 1800s with um, something called a daguerreotype. Now a daguerreotype is not this, but it's close to this. So I'm going to just kind of use this as the example for now and then we'll talk a little bit about what this is. So a daguerreotype, we, I, we call them, people in the business call them DAGs for short. Um, they were the first practical form of photographer, for photography. They were put on a thin copper metal base there was silver on top and the silver parts were like a mirror and then they were sealed in glass for protection and because they were so delicate they were almost always put in a wooden case or a leather case now this one is a leather case beautiful it's only one half of a leather case but usually when you see them and I see these all the time at flea markets and estate sales and things they're like a book there's a hinge, um, see right here where there's these clasps, the latches that keep it closed. So there would have been another side, maybe the parents were on this side, and it would close. And um, they had to be protected because they are so delicate. Now we can tell this is not a DAG 
because there's no mirroring when we go like this. If it was a dag, you literally would look at these silver parts and it would look like a mirror. You would see the reflection of what's on the ceiling or out my window right now. You wouldn't see just the background. So that's how we know that this is uh, not a dag. And so basically, uh, this was kind of popular, like 1839 to 1860. So we're talking about around Civil War time. And these um, were, you know, you didn't get many of these in your life. Look how ornate and, and special they are. You had to be upper middle class, a middle class family. Not everybody was getting these. Um, after that point, they did something called a salt print. And I don't know if I'm going to pr pronounce this right, but they're also going to have um, something called an albumin print, which we'll talk about more later. But there are several types of metal type of pictures. So you have your dag, but then you have a, a tin type. And a tin type um, was a little bit of an overlap in the time period. It's sort of the, the dags came first and towards the end of dags came tin types. And tin types are something that you will find at flea markets and things like that. I don't find them particularly useful for our particular artwork. Um, and I don't know that I'd ever want to alter one. But I have a few examples here. And you could photograph them or scan them. And I'm wondering if mixed media people, if they weren't in good shape, like this one is not in great shape, if it would be great to use um, in some kind of a, you know, piece that has lots of different mixed media on it. But look how beautiful this piece is with the two women. And they're always slightly, sometimes they're slightly tinted around the cheek, the cheekbones. This is a very big tin type. You don't usually find them this big. Generally, they're this size. So let me show you this one. I love this one I found. And I bought this as part of a lot. I didn't buy this specifically on its own. Look at these guys. Their clothing. Aren't they amazing? So I could scan this and make this part of an image in a scrapbook or a, uh, a junk journal, a mixed media piece. Um, so this would be what would be considered a tin type. Here's now see this one. This is a really cool one too. With the ladies and their and their um, fans. And we actually found this in a group of paper. Um, there was some photography with some some negatives and there's a negative from the 1950s made of this so this was a really cool find that we just found last week and then there's something called jewel tintypes and these would have been popular around the Civil War and you could you know maybe take your wife or your girlfriend a soldier could you know take them with them as a little image of the person they loved to war and definitely that's a Civil War image look at that so this girl would have been in like the pocket of a soldier when he went off. Now these would be amazing things to have as part of a junk journal. Would I use the original? Probably not, but these would be very beautiful to scan. And as I'm showing you these, keep in mind, that's exactly what I'm gonna do with everything I'm showing you. So at some point, these images are all going to be released in digital format. It's something I'm working on right now and hoping to get out. So when we're talking about you know the Civil War era, if you were making a, a junk journal, that was about the time period of Gone with the Wind, the middle to late 1800s, these would all be appropriate images to use in those journals. So that would be a really cool little addition um, to your ephemera. And, and just think about making some kind of beautiful ephemera with a window and sticking her picture behind it. It'd be lovely. So the first kind of photography for dating is these metal types. The dags, there's another one called an ambro, uh, ambro and then um, a tin type. You're not going to come across these as often and they're, they cost more than getting like a lot of photography, but there are some really interesting images. Um, but if you come across them, that's what they are. 
so moving on, we're now moving to sort of the 18, 1860s. I think that the photography that I most love looking at and thinking about using as inspiration and um, materials for my junk journals and my mixed media are the next two types. And these are the most common you're going to see. So this size is called a CDV or a carte de viste. And it was named after the photographer who developed this type of technique. And it's taking something called an albumen print, which is um, basically a print on paper using their t technique in photography at that time. And then they, they put it on a cardstock. Now, what? how can you tell that it's a CDV? Because all CDVs, for the most part, are the same size. They're 2.5 inches by 4 inches. They're almost, almost always a portrait. And the date is 1850 to 1900. These were popular. So if you find one of these, you already have a time span of when you can figure out who, you know, when this was and what the person in it when they lived. So when we're looking at pictures and trying to date them, we want to fit them with maybe the theme of the journal we'll join. So if we're doing a Victorian themed journal in the late 1800s, we definitely want to be looking for one of these two formats. We also can take cues from several things that tell us a lot about um, the photography. The most important things to look at when you're trying to figure out what time period it is and um, you're trying to date it, is you try to look at the subject matter. It's a portrait. You look at the costume and that's, you know, what are they dressing? What are they, what are the, what's the hairstyle? What is the jewelry that they, they're, they're wearing? And then a lot of times it's what's the accessory. Later years they printed with, they did things, portraits with specific wicker chairs or specific props that you can date um, the photography from. So let's look at a few of these and see why they're so exciting to use in our projects. So first of all, look at this image. It is just beautiful. Her, her dress is, is gorgeous. Um, usually on the back you will find an advertisement for the photographer and that gives you a lot of information. You can go in and kind of look at when they were around and get some more information about the photographer. Sometimes somebody's written something on them. So this is Margaret McBride and she's from Massachusetts. So McBride is an Irish name. So maybe you were going to do a, a themed journal about a um, Irish woman who was an immigrant um, over to New England in the 1800s. This would be a beautiful image to use in that. We have this gentleman and again the way that they their hairstyle and their grooming will also tell you when um, the image is. So I love the backs of these. I think these are just as exciting to put graphically in our in our journals. I think they're lovely to look at. And I'll go through some of these quickly. So as I said I am currently scanning these and gently adjusting them and I will be set, putting out kits of these lovely people, ladies, men, kids, as inspiration um, for journals or just um, for ephemeral use. I, I just love everything about the fronts and the backs of these. And again, these are considered CDVs. Look at the pearls or the, the, the hair is amazing to me. And I love the jewelry too. And then we have, look at this darling girl. So every now and then you'll get something a little bit more decorative that has a little bit more of a cut, like this one does. And we have this little girl. And sometimes you will see them on the dark board as well with the, um, with the name and put in here. A lot of times these were the ones that went into photo albums, that slipped into photo albums. So these are CDVs. So if you ever want to search for them or buy lots of them, um, you would search for CDVs, carte de viste. The second kind 
are called cabinet cards and they were popular a little bit they overlapped these were popular at the same time these came out in 1866 and again there's these are a lot of um, portraiture as, as well and usually it's a single person but this would be where you'd see a lot of, of doubles so we have this one here of a brother and a sister very plain back and they're um, always like put on you can kind of feel where the 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 print is put on the cardstock and some of these have very decorative backs and some of them have um, just the decoration at the bottom oh this next one I love and she will definitely be part of a kit check her out isn't she amazing And this one I cannot figure out whether it's a real cabinet card or if it's a salesman sample of sort of like what you could buy for the season of 1893-1894 like if that if it was an advertisement for this photographer I have to look into it more the fact that it says ivory type it says the season and it has several different portraitures I think it may be an advertisement we have ones with darker backs, scalloped edges. Again, with the scalloped edge, the jewelry. These were not, um, these were your middle and upper middle class people. I don't, just based on the outfits they're wearing and the, the things that they have in their hair, um, we're talking about, you know, not everybody had these. But the faces are always have a story to tell in my mind, and that can be interpreted by the artist when we're making a journal or doing a canvas or something like that. His face to me is, is so interesting. And again, look how look how beautiful the backs are. There was one I oh look at look at these are metallic. Aren't those great? So I'll be scanning these and I'm going to be making kits and um, look for those soon. That's like my goal. That's my July goal. I have some big things coming down the pike, one of which is two journals that I'm going to be storytelling with. And um, that video will be coming out soon, hopefully soon. And um, it'll be again around pictures like this. And hopefully I'll have kits out at that point. Every now and then you will come across something unusual, like a different size. Or on the smaller size, you'll see two people in it, which is unusual as well. It's usually the bigger ones, the cabinet cards that they have those in. So before 1900, we're talking about the metal photography, like these. And then we're talking about CDVs and cabinet cards. After 1900, we still were, you still will find some CDVs and um, cabinet cards up to about the 1920s. And then in the 1920s, you start moving closer to uh, pictures that are just put on plain card stock that are mounted to card that have pictures of families, like children. You, people started investing in getting portraits of their children done. And they were for framing and for, um, you know, frames that are on the wall and then photo books. Beautiful imagery. And um, you'll also find sometimes cabinet cards that are unusual shapes. Isn't that adorable? And I love the fact that it's cut right there and that's part of the picture. It's such a pretty, pretty image. So this would be, you know, the beginning of 1900s to 1920. Then we start coming into the Kodak generation where people had little brownie, brownie um, cameras and they could start taking pictures themselves. And that's also a wonderful thing for themed journals and mixed media but we're getting away from the 
you know, Victorian and Wardian ages, the flapper generation, and we're getting more into World War One, World War Two, in the 50s. And it's sort of that really nostalgic feel um, that, you know, we still can find some, some portraits that are formal, but we're getting a lot of these informal shots that have so much energy to them and they're so relatable because you know they start looking a little bit more like us like the way we lived and but in yeah a simpler simpler time these are from the 1940s and these kids are just adorable and i love that they're just that square brownie print um, that's so typical of that time and they just look really adorable in journals and mixed media and you can really tell a story with the imagery like can't you just make a story around this picture like who is she what why is she standing there what is her story and then there's just so much great um you know what you this could be used in so many different layouts and there's such a nostalgia to so many of these kinds of prints. And then of course you have occupations you can use um, as inspiration or themes, right? Different time periods. And just you're just looking for expressive faces, faces that tell stories in themselves. You can either tell your own story around a picture or you know, you can let the picture tell the story. And the last um, thing I wanted to talk about photography is when you have the opportunity to get a stack of photography from the same family. Sometimes that can really open up a whole storytelling, even if you don't tell the specific story of that family. I don't know this family. I just know they're all the same family. I know this is the grandmother because on the back it says, your pretty grandmother. Jennifer, hmm, what does that say? Corker? Corer? Copper? I don't know. But she kind of has a flapper look, and you can tell that by the short hairstyle, the very um, plain shift dress. So this is probably 1920s, 1930s, which makes sense because um, her granddaughter is this beautiful lady. And the pictures I have of her, this is her when she was younger. Isn't she beautiful? Um, she marries and she's in Tokyo with her GI husband after World War II. And I've just taken some of the pictures from this family because I just want to show you how interesting one grouping of pictures can be and how many journals could be you know jumped out of from them so we have these beautiful shots which he really must have adored her because there's so many photos of her and I know he took them because he takes a lot of pictures um, in in the things I have he's a very good photographer and um, he has so many pictures of his wife and she is stunning and her the family is beautiful and this is the family and they go over to Tokyo after World War II. So there's some really interesting photos of the kids in kimonos. And pictures of the whole family dressed up in Tokyo Japanese um, costume. And then they have they have families who they're obviously close to while they're in Tokyo, which add all these wonderful pictures of people that are very different from us at the time. Um, I don't find a lot of pictures of Asian, of Asian people from the 1940s and 50s, and it's great to have some, some beautiful images of beautiful people that can be used um, you know, when people are making collages or making working in junk journals, they, they're not, we're not all the same. We have different cultures and different backgrounds. We want to see people that look like us, remind us of us. So I'm always happy when I find different cultures so I can reflect those in my kits. I love these pictures. 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the story is between her children and this family, but I would love to know. But I don't even ever have to know. I can, I can make up my own story, which is also really fun. And again, these are like some of the pictures he took. He he took pictures in the winter in Tokyo. Look at this great picture with masks. And again, I love seeing pictures with all sorts of different kinds of kids together back in the day. And, you know, photography, when we're making journals, you know, I think I'm going to do a video on storytelling through journals. But photography can be such a great jumping off point because you may know that you want to do a journal, let's say from the 1920s, and you need an inspiration or a muse for that journal. You find one picture from that time period and study it and then you can and then you can develop a whole story around that. So that's our little primer and I hope that there was some information in there that was handy to you um, from the names of the types to how to date your your photography. So that's it. That's July's edition of Tea With Me. I'm almost done my tea, and I want to give you a thank you, a big thank you to everybody who tuned in. And if you made it to this point, I really appreciate you sticking around with me. Um, this month, look for a giveaway on my Instagram. Some, hopefully, some digitals of these beautiful images that I have in my collection. Some more videos on storytelling and um, concept journals, theme journals. I absolutely love the idea of those and I want to delve more into that. I have a couple in the works that I want to share with you. And I'm hoping to put out a little garden update too because, oh my gosh, that's like a whole other thing that's just taking up my life and I'm really enjoying. I hope everybody stays safe, has a wonderful July, um, can escape your world for bits and just enjoy um, doing whatever it is that makes you feel light. I will talk to you soon and stay safe.